Growing plants to their genetic potential. Most of what I'm going to talk about today can be applied to both hydroponic or soil gardening. When I talk about growing plants to their genetic potential, I'm not talking about growing plants to this ginormous, unhealthy size. Uh, because we all know that you can give a plant so much nitrogen that it will grow to this ginormous plant, but then it may not, it probably won't produce any fruit. And, and if it does, will it be of the same quality as if you had just given the plant what it needed? rather than trying to pump it up kind of like a, a jockey that takes steroids or something like that. Um, we know that steroids can have side effects that could even cause somebody to um, not be able to reproduce. And essentially this is what can happen to plants too because if they don't produce fruit they're not going to reproduce. So uh, again when I talk about growing to the genetic potential I'm talking about growing a plant to uh, the, the healthiest that that plant can be so that we can maximize our yields without sacrificing quality. And when I talk about quality, I'm talking about both taste and nutritional value. I'm an avid home gardener and I've put a lot of effort into making sure that I'm able to grow the best food for my family. This took a lot of research to really uh, make sure that I'm providing uh, not only food, you know, plants that can produce an abundance of food that I can provide, but also to make sure that I grow this food in a way that is good for everybody, good for the environment, um, as well as providing just good nutritional value in the food itself. In 2015, I grew enough veggies to fill this counter at least six times. I grew everything from tomatoes to peppers to sweet peppers to hot peppers, cucumbers. At one point I compiled a list of the things that I was growing and uh, came out to well over 40 different things that I was growing in my garden. So today I'm not going to talk about the, the basics of gardening. This is going to be more of a, a meaty, you know, things that you, you may not hear all the time type of thing unless you actually do the research but I've done a lot of research and I'm just gonna provide uh, the best stuff that I can to you guys right now so I'm not going to talk about things like lighting and what sort of lights should you have for growing indoors and all that stuff uh, I mean but I will say the best light that you can have is the Sun uh, but if you have to grow indoors you, you might need to uh, research what sort of lighting you need. The first thing I do want to talk about is seeds and actually growing your own plants from seeds. And this is because it really affects how a plant does uh, for the season as far as how that plant starts off. How is it taken care of from the point that it's a seed all the way to maturity. So I can't stress enough how important it is to start your own seeds, especially if you're an organic grower. Because if you're an organic grower and you go to, say, a big box store and you buy a bunch of tomato plants or something, and you don't know how they were taken care of, more than likely they were uh, fed with synthetic fertilizers. So you take it, you put it in your garden, and now you've completely changed uh, the way that these plants are getting fed. And this can slow things down. They can basically go into shock. Um, I mean, there's always a risk of shock, but there's even more of a risk if you're doing it that way. If you're growing your seeds um, from start to finish, uh, you got a much better chance of growing that plant to its genetic potential. If you supplement with fertilizers, less is always better than too much, especially when it comes to nitrogen. If your plants get nitrogen burn, you might as well start over. Also, things like too much phosphorus can lock up potassium. Too much potassium can lock up magnesium. So it's best to hold back on the fertilizers. And then if you start to see that your plant is becoming deficient in a particular nutrient, uh, spoon feed it that particular nutrient. Less when it comes to fertilizers is always better. While we're on the topic of fertilizer, when your plants are 
starting to flower and bloom and they're, they're getting ready they're making all of these uh, flower parts and they're getting ready to produce fruit plants can quickly deplete potassium and magnesium during this stage so you may notice a bit of a deficiency and you may spoon feed a little bit and this is important because magnesium is the central element of the chlorophyll molecule this is what makes plants green uh, magnesium also works in conjunction with phosphorus when fruiting. Uh, what some people like to do is they like to take uh, Epsom salt, which is magnesium sulfate, basically magnesium and sulfur, and spoon feed their plants with that, either by mixing it in with their water that they're watering their plants in with, or by simply you know, working it into the, or mulching with it, or working it into the, you know, first one inch of, of soil. Now, uh, this actually helps in a couple different ways, because it, it can help if you have a magnesium deficiency, but also the sulfur, and your plants need sulfur, and these things, again, are typically found in your soil, but if you have a deficiency, your plant is not going to grow to its genetic potential. Uh, the plant, when it takes up the sulfur, it makes this amino acid called cysteine. Now, this amino acid cysteine actually helps to turn on a gene that tells the plant to make flowering parts. So, if your plant is not making flowers and producing fruit, this could be one of the reasons. So, if you're going to maximize your yield, you want to make sure that you're not getting a magnesium or a sulfur deficiency. Now, while we're on the subject of amino acids, amino acids actually help the uptake of calcium. So how many videos have you seen out there of gardeners who are having difficulties with calcium deficiencies? And there are many things that can cause this, but amino acids will actually help the uptake of calcium through that transpiration stream. So uh, the amino acids will actually open up these calcium ion channels. And instead of allowing just one calcium molecule through at a time, uh, with the aid of amino acids, we're talking about a thousand, up to a thousand calcium molecules going into those calcium ion channels up into the transpiration stream. Now calcium is only taken up through the transpiration stream. Uh, so this is the same stream that, you know, water is taken up, through, water is taken up through the roots, up the stem, throughout the leaves, throughout the fruit of the plant. So calcium is only taken up through the transpiration stream. Now, other ways that you can get uh, calcium deficiency is if there is no transpiration going on. So that either the plant doesn't get water or if you have high humidity. Okay, we saw these people in Texas getting massive amounts of rain. And these people think they have no calcium in their soil. So they're dumping calcium into the soil. And then they're changing the pH of the soil. And now they've, their soil is so alkaline that the plant can't take up the calcium anyway. Well, with the high humidity that they have in Texas and the rains and everything else, the, the plant isn't transpiring. It's not releasing the moisture from its leaves. If the moisture doesn't leave the leaf of the plant, the plant doesn't take up more water. It can't because there isn't any movement of water. If there isn't movement of water, there isn't any movement of calcium in that transpiration stream. So you may have cases where you see the calcium doesn't make its way through the plant. Uh, and then you're gonna get things like blossom end rot in your tomatoes and in your peppers. Okay, so no amount of calcium that you put in the soil is gonna fix that. You've got to get that plant transpiring. So you could possibly do that by changing the humidity levels. Uh, of course, if you're growing outside, <laughs> you know, I don't know what you're gonna do. You have to figure something out. Um, maybe you can put a fan on your plants. I, I don't know. So how can you add amino acids to your garden? You can buy it. You can also, there are amino acids in the various kelp fertilizers out there. 
Um, you can simply add compost to your garden that's going to contain amino acids. Uh, some people use worm compost or vermicompost. Now also if your soil is too alkaline your plants aren't going to be able to take up other nutrients, micronutrients like iron, manganese, zinc. So what can help with the uptake of these nutrients and these minerals? Humic acid. Okay, humic acid helps to provide the food to the plant. So now you're probably wondering, how can I add humic acid to my garden? And it's actually quite simple. Compost, I mean, you can certainly get other amendments and if you want to buy things in the store that, that contain humic acid, you can, you know, buy different amendments. You can buy humic acid in the store. But the, the simplest way to add humic acid is add good compost, aged compost. Uh, but my favorite is vermicompost. Now, one of the miracles of humic acid is that if you have this in your soil, then it can help your plants uptake those nutrients and those minerals, even though your soil becomes alkaline. Now, there are also other little guys in your soil that will help with the uptake of nutrients, um, regardless of, uh, I mean, pretty much, even if your pH isn't spot on, uh, these guys will help uptake nutrients and minerals. And this is the rhizobacteria and other bacteria that you have in your soil. Now, rhizobacteria is magic. They actually make growth hormones, B vitamins, amino acids, other organic acids, fulvic acid, humic acid, and other volatile organic compounds. So the rhizobacteria in your soil produce volatile organic compounds. This means that these organic compounds are extremely volatile. You can't put them in a bottle and you can't sell them to people. So if you don't have good organic conditions, good organic soil promoting rhizobacteria, you're not going to be able to give your plants this benefit of these volatile organic, organic compounds. So how are you going to promote rhizobacteria in your soil? Grow organically. If you're using things like synthetic fertilizer, you're bypassing the bacteria in your soil and feeding the plant directly. Because by adding the, the NPK in this synthetic form, you're bypassing the bacteria. Now the plant has food that it needs. It takes it up. The bacteria don't get fed. The plant it is partially responsible for feeding that bacteria the sugar they need to survive. The, the plant releases sugar through its roots, feeds the bacteria. The bacteria in turn can, can make these uh, different things for the plant. And it's this symbiotic relationship. And if you interrupt that by feeding your plant synthetic fertilizers, you are harming the bacteria in the soil. So this has been uh, well documented and well seen uh, just by looking at um, how farming has developed over the past hundred years and the state that our, our soil is currently in. Other ways you can help uh, the rhizobacteria and, uh, and millions of other bacteria in your soil is vermicompost. This is the number one thing that you could do if you want to grow plants to their genetic potential. The, the worm, its gut, is the perfect incubator for bacteria, where bacteria can just grow and thrive. And what the worm produces for your soil just cannot be replaced by anything. So this is one benefit that soil gardeners can have over hydroponic uh, gardeners. I actually, I'm, I'm not a big fan of the hydroponic growing after researching it. Um, 
I, I was very curious when I first heard about it and I saw the results that other people are getting. Um, but I, I am not a fan of it for these reasons. There are just things that you cannot provide to the plants in a hydroponic system. Not to mention most hydroponic growers, they have to empty out their systems. They gotta dump that water and all those chem salts or those other synthetic fertilizers that they have in there are just going out into the ground and, and causing other damage, harming earthworm populations, killing bacteria in the soil. Uh, so I know there's a lot of people out there who like it. It, it looks fun. Uh, it's easy to do. Um, and I actually follow a couple of people on YouTube who do it um, because they're their channels are really good and it's, it's nice to see their success. But at the same time, it's just not the way I choose to grow because I believe in um, creating good soil, being stewards of the soil. As my friend uh, Patrick from the One Yard Revolution channel would say. So how are you going to add these uh, rhizobacteria and other things to your soil? The cheapest way is to start your own worm farm. I do have a video uh, when I started my worm farm. I showed you guys how to start a worm farm, so you might check that out. It's very cheap, very easy. It doesn't stink at all. So check it out because um, worm composting will provide the what we talked about as far as the amino acids, the humic acids, the volatile organic compounds, the bacteria, everything you need the hormones the growth hormones there's no need to buy expensive kelp products not to mention the fact that that you're mining kelp from the sea uh, our oceans and our fish are already in a lot of trouble do we really want to be harvesting kelp from the ocean not a good idea vermicompost can provide everything and more that kelp does the growth hormones, everything. So uh, you might also, if you want to learn more information on kelp and kelp uh, fertilizers, uh, Alberta Urban Garden, Stephen has a video on that. I'll put a link to that as well. I've had a lot of success using this organic method. The, the instant that you start using worm castings and, and vermicompost, you are going to see results instantaneously if at all possible do it it's a blast and it is one of the it, it the best thing that you could do for your garden really is uh vermicompost uh thanks so much for being here and uh thanks for supporting the channel please help by sharing the video uh give it a thumbs up leave a comment uh if there's anything else you want to know about or you want to add to this discussion, please feel free to do so. Have a nice day.